Well, thank you for, for inviting me today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how to build 3D representations of the world. Uh, we want to make 3D representations of the world um, because we want to build AR and VR systems. And the first building block for content creation is always 3D reconstruction. Um, the first thing we need to do is to capture the real world uh, before we can edit or synthesize new content. Um, and the important thing I think that I'm going to focus on today is that we need to do this in an, in an agile way. Um, so that's why I'm going to be talking about how to reconstruct with a single RGB camera uh, or with, um, with a single video um, or with uh, you know, videos that come from an RGB or an RGBD camera. But this kind of focus on, on monocular. Um, so when, when we look at images as humans, we get an instant sense of, of 3D. Um, and some of it is purely geometric uh, because perspective is, is helping us to understand, for instance, the layout of this market. Um, but a lot of our 3D understanding is also via our prior knowledge. Um, so we know, you know roughly the shape of different things. Um, we can even tell you know, the, the size and the, and, and the weight of, of some of these fruits that we can see here. Um, there's so much prior knowledge that a 3D understanding seems like a perfect task for a machine learning algorithm. Um, so now the trouble is that when we look at the large computer vision data sets that have been collected over the years for image recognition and detection, it turns out that they only have, um, they only have 2D annotations, right? Or mostly 2D annotations. Um, so 2D annotations such as class labels and masks and key points, they're relatively easy and, and quite cheap to annotate. But if we actually want to align images uh, with accurate 3D shapes or meshes, so what you see on the right, this is actually extremely hard and expensive. Um, although some really important efforts have happened in recent years to collect 3D data sets such as ScanNet, for instance, or Matterport, um, they're mostly limited to indoor scenes. So therefore, um, the easy way to go about 3D reconstruction using machine learning, which would be a fully supervised uh, approach based on 3D losses, is completely out of the question. Um, but you know, if we look back in, in, in history, um, it turns out that we have actually solved the problem of 3D reconstruction from weak annotations um, or directly from images without any 3D labels at all before. Um, so if we look back at old school geometric uh, methods for 3D reconstruction, they're in essence self-supervised really, what we now call self-supervised. Um, so one of the big successes in the area of this geometric computer vision was structure from motion. You know, we still, we still use it today as a, as a big building block of our systems. Um, and there we take as input a collection of images, as you see there on the right, we extract some point features, we establish correspondences, and then we estimate the parameters of our 3D representation, which is what you can see here in, in green, which in this case are the camera poses and uh, the 3D coordinates of the points um, in the world. And then what we do is that we estimate those parameters such that when we project them back onto the images, we get back our observations. So they agree with our observations. So we're learning a 3D representation, but our loss is 2D. There's no 3D annotations at all. Um, another example is multi-view stereo, where here our observations are the images themselves. And the problem that we're trying to solve is, can we reconstruct a dense 3D mesh such that when we re-render our estimate back uh, onto the images, our synthesized observations agree with our input images. So this methodology is also called analysis by synthesis. Um, and to do this, we essentially use a, a photometric loss to guide the estimation of the depth of each point. Um, so these two examples I've chosen, the inference of the parameters of the 3D representation is done via optimization. But the intuition here is that we could also use neural networks, for instance, um, as to, to represent the 3D scene. Um, given, uh, given that our loss in this case is, is being able to resynthesize the, the original images. 
Um, so, you know, just kind of bear this in mind for, for what comes um, later. So now a, a world of options uh, opens. Um, so for instance, which representations do we use? Um, either explicit representations such as voxel grids uh, or implicit and continuous representations such as a sign distance function um, or an even more exciting current trend is to represent a scene via a fully connected network that stores uh, values such as occupancy for each 3D uh, point location. Um, also, which image formation models do we use? Um, we can use perspective projection, um, but we can even model how light interacts with the geometry to form an image. So we can not just you know, reconstruct or infer the geometry, but also the lighting or even the material. Um, in terms of observations, we can use key points as we saw before, or masks, or just the images themselves. Um, either RGB or RGBD plus, uh, RGB plus depth. Um, and then, of course, an important thing, as I said before, is what annotations do we use? And in general, what we really want to avoid is, is to be using 3D or, or strong supervision. We want to actually build self-supervised uh, models or, um, or build these models with, with just 2D, 2D labels, for instance. So, so far we've talked about capturing a static world, um, but in many cases, what we want to do is also to capture the dynamics. We want to learn 3D representations that can explain not just a single instant in time, but that can capture any possible deformation and configuration. And this is actually the main topic of my research, uh, learning 3D deformable models that can explain how the shapes of objects evolve over time, or how they vary across a category and learning them from images only. Um, so this brings in one more important element to our 3D representation, which is shape deformation priors that encapsulate the variations of shapes and deformations across a category of objects. Um, so typically these are pre-trained from thousands of 3D scans. So using 3D training data um, some of these are parametric, such as 3D morphable models for faces or the simple uh, body model, but others are neural representations that are encapsulated in the weights of a neural network. And then at test time, the problem can be framed as, can we fit the parameters of our model to the current observations where the observations are our images? So the question we really want to ask uh, here is, can we build these shape priors, can we learn them from images directly without the need for any, um, with, for any 3D training data? So th this is quite, quite important. So these, uh, these shape priors, you know, if we know that we're going to be looking at faces only, or if we know that we're going to be looking at bodies or cars, we can, we can pre-train a model. Um, but, but sometimes if we want to, to be able to, to reconstruct the world, uh, and there's going to be a, a variety of objects um, and we don't want to strictly restrict ourselves to it to a single category then you know we want to go towards we, we want to also solve the problem of learning shape priors directly from images um, so you know model free approaches so i'm going to show you one example this is quite old work from cbpr 13 so a long time ago um, but here, you know, we were already working on, on trying to learn deformable priors, uh, deformable shape priors directly from images uh, without the need for any 3D supervision at all, not, not even pre-trained, not even using a pre-trained face model. Um, so the idea here is that giving a video sequence of a deforming object, we want to reconstruct a dense per pixel model for every frame of the sequence. So. Um, here we have all the frames and we want to reconstruct the, the, the shape for every frame. And what are our observations in this case? So we take the original video, we track all the pixels in the image over the entire sequence. Um, so, you know, you could call this multi-frame optical flow. Um, so our observations are actually the 2D point trajectories over time. Um, this is some other work that, that we had developed in advance. So now we want we have these observations, we have the, the, the dense tracking 
in 2D in the image. And what we want to do is reconstruct a model such that when we project the mesh back onto the image via the camera, we get our observations back. Um, so the 3D points reproject back on the tracks. Um, but this is obviously not enough. There would be an infinite number of possible uh, shapes or reconstructions that could reproject into the same measurement. So we need to add a prior. And this is where we're learning a prior. And we're learning the prior directly from, from the images. And in this case, the prior is that if we take all the reconstructed shapes from the entire sequence, they actually low, lie in a low dimensional embedding. So what we're imposing um, is that the, the trace norm is actually minimized. So what we're doing is trying to explain all the frames in the sequence with a few, as few components as possible. So K is a lot smaller than the number of frames. So we don't know what these components are in advance. We haven't done PCA in advance and then, and then fitted um, our, our sequence to, to this PCA basis. We're, we're, we're learning what is the, uh, the low rank representation that best explains this, this scene. So essentially what we're saying is that the shape at each frame can be explained as a linear combination of some basis shapes, but these basis shapes are actually unknown. So we take all these terms and we include also a spatial smoothness prior to promote smooth surfaces and we optimize. So you can see that our losses are purely 2D. Uh, it's a reprojection error. And our final scene representation is a low rank embedding that can explain the frames, uh, in all the frames in the sequence. And we could potentially use this embedding later to fit to, to new scenes. Um, and here are some results on face reconstruction. Uh, this was the very first dense non-rigid 3D reconstruction method. Um, and we, you know, we also had a fast GPU implementation. Um, and here, what we can see is that it's a great advantage that we can also reconstruct any type of shape because it's, it's model free. We're actually learning the low rank representation directly from the data. So you can see different, different types of, um, of, def of deforming objects. So here you see a heart and, and we, we had other different objects. So we can take this same analysis by synthesis approach further by modifying the loss to be a photometric loss so that we can jointly track and reconstruct the shape rather than having to split it into two steps. Um, and then the idea here is, is the same again. So now what we're doing is we're trying to, uh, we're trying to learn uh, a dense 3D deformation field that tells us where each of the vertices is actually moving in the next frame, um, such that when we render back the, the reconstructed frame, then we get back the, the, our observations. In this case, it's, it's our, our image. And um, you know, here you can see that um, we get some very nice results. So these are pretty strong deformations and uh, we can, you know, this is monocular, uh, a single RGBD sequence and we can reconstruct um, and we can reconstruct in an online way. Okay, so this is this is great when we're looking at objects for which we don't have enough 3D training data to pre-train a, a 3D prior. But in some cases, such as the case of the human face, these models actually exist. Uh, we, we've got really, really good uh, 3D morphable models and they can be used for tracking. So the idea is the same. We estimate the model parameters, in this case, the show, shape, the, uh, the shape, the pose, the albedo, illumination and expression, such that when we resynthesize the images, we get back the same observations. And this modeling actually works incredibly well. When we resynthesize the observations using the estimated model, here you can see that in, in yellow, um, the errors are tiny when we compare with the original image with the ground truth. So the fact that we're modeling the face accurately in 3D means that we can later edit these parameters and we can resynthesize new movements for the face. Um, so in 2017, we saw an incredible opportunity to start up a company with the mission to empower everyone to make video content without cameras, microphones, or studios. So we founded Synthesia um, and we started off with video to video transfer. So we had an input video, uh, we were tracking the input video and we were transferring the motion to the uh, resynthesized video. And this was our first public facing uh, project. Malaria isn't just any disease. 
It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Speak up and say, malaria must... Okay, so of course Beckham doesn't speak any of those languages, but we tracked other actors speaking their own languages and transferred the lip motion and resynthesized the new video. Um, but now we're, we're at, a, at a new stage, uh, much more exciting. Now we can generate the 3D lip motion parameters directly uh, from, from speech, uh, or we can actually just type the text to make a video. Um, so this is what you can see here. So this is our platform and our text to video platform is now used by thousands of customers, uh, individuals, companies, uh, and they use it to generate videos for internal training, for learning, for corporate, corporate communication, or, or generally for turning boring text um, into, into video. Um, so here you can see an example and, and anyone can, can go to our website and, and generate a, a, a demo video. I can show you. I'm excited thing. to be here to demonstrate how Synthesia allows you to make videos simply by typing text. The reason it works so well is that my face is modeled in 3D. Okay, so you can I'm see excited that to be here to demonstrate how you could see that I I, I type the text in here and I and I very easily uh, generated the the video. Um, so this is this is great. This is very exciting because you know we can generate new content um, um, and uh, you know we can generate uh, faces uh, of people talking. Uh, it's very exciting, but uh, you know, we also want to be able to represent scenes and that, that's going to be the, the, next, um, the next topic I'm going to try to cover. Um, so we've seen so far how embedding 3D shape priors into 3D reconstruction of deformable objects works really well. So now we're going to move on to how to represent full scenes. Um, so a representation that's been very successful is to represent the scene at the level of objects, where we're not just representing the scene as a bunch of 3D points, um, but they also, we, we, we're kind of segmenting the objects and we're assigning semantic labels uh, to those objects. Um, so the trick here, so this is some, some work from 2018. So the trick here is to combine uh, 3D reconstruction with 2D detectors and 2D semantic masks and to transfer these labels onto the 3D model in a consistent manner over time. So this system is called mask fusion. It takes in RGBD images as input um, and this is all working in real time. You can see that also the scene can be dynamic. So currently the, the person is manipulating is picking up the bottle and it's moving it around. But what you can see there is that uh, we can only reconstruct the visible parts of the scene, so only what's really visible in the image. So how can we actually move to the example on the right where we reconstruct each object as a complete shape, even when we have partial observations? So the key here is to use a pre-learned 3D shape prior for each object category. Um, so we use DeepSDF in this case, which is a novel way to represent shapes in a compact way as a neural network that predicts the sign distance value for every 3D point. And DeepSDF can be pre-trained from 3D data. Um, so at training time, the weights of the decoder are learned, but also an embedding of latent codes where each training shape will be assigned a different code in the embedding. And at test time, we take um, we're taking incomplete observations, so this could be like a, a depth image, for instance, um, and what we try to do is to optimize the code that best represents that, that particular shape. So we fix the decoder and we just optimize the code. Um, so what we asked ourselves was, could we estimate these shape code vectors just from images without the need for any 3D data at test time? Um, so we followed an analysis by synthesis optimization, 
So given our current estimates for the object pose and the shape code, as you can see here, we decode the shape using the pre-trained deep SDF decoder, and we synthesize our new observations. And our losses are 2D only, photometric consistency, a silhouette loss, and a key point loss. Um, and as you can see, uh, now we take, um, we take this sequence, we learn the embedding prior uh, to, the, to the reconstruction, and we operate in four steps. First of all, um, we detect the objects uh, in the RGB frames, then uh, we, we lift these detections into 3D, 3D bounding boxes, then we estimate um, shape codes for all the frames, and this is a, a inferred by a network. And then the shape codes are refined in two stages based on multiple cost terms, the, the terms that I, that I uh, explained earlier. And you can see that we can represent uh, the scene as a collection of objects. And the nice thing is that these objects are, are complete. We have complete shapes, even though we might have very, very partial observations and some parts of the objects are not visible at all. Um, so these are some examples from, uh, from the, uh, the Scanet data set, for instance, which is uh, quite a, a challenging data set. And here on the, on the far right, you can see uh, the quality of our reconstructions compared with some other methods. Okay, and we can also embed this into a, a SLAM system, for instance, um, and we can uh, and we can reconstruct. Uh, you know, for instance, it could be a, a monocular SLAM system or a stereo system, um, and we can reconstruct the scene again as a collection of objects. Um, and I'm just going to show you, you know, some examples on the on the Kitty data set. So you can see here that. On the Kitty data set, we're going along, we're detecting the objects, and we are reconstructing them using the shape priors. So we end up, end up with a really rich map. You can see it just there. Uh, we end up with a really rich map that you know has all of the objects as well as the the camera poses and uh, and and some sparse points. We can even do this from from monocular input, just from an RGB sequence. So this is, um, yeah, this is also, this is running in, in real time as well. Okay, so just, just to finish off, I'm going to talk about just one, one last project. Um, so we've used, uh, so, so far we've talked about how to use the neural representation to describe the geometry of objects. So how to represent using deep SDF. Um, but of course, you know, NERF has, has taught us recently that we can use this also to represent the entire scene. Um, so in this paper, the idea of using a fully connected network is, is, is taken uh, even further and, and they showed that uh, there's no need for 3D data at training time. So we can learn the weights of a neural network where given the coordinates of the 3D point and the viewing direction, can infer its RGB color and density so that we can then render a uh, new view. So once we've learned this representation, we can uh, learn, render new views. Um, so NERV represents the scene as a, as a network uh, that takes in this XYZ location and viewing direction. Um, so it, it, it actually fits really nicely with the analysis by synthesis model that we saw before. So this, this looks very, very similar to uh, multi-view stereo. So our observations are our images, the post images. Now our, our, our scene representation, instead of being an explicit mesh, it's going to be a neural network um, that's representing the scene such that when we render it, uh, in this case, using volume rendering, that's what was used in, in NERF, we synthesize back our observations. And uh, really as cool as NERF is one issue is that it has to be trained from scratch for every new scene and the training is incredibly slow. So what if instead we want to model the variations of shape and texture across a category and generalize not just to unseen viewpoints, but also to unseen objects within the same class. Um, so this is work that we did for uh, ICCV last year and it's called Code NERF. Um, so what we've learned before is that um, we need to learn a shape embedding 
or shape prior that encapsulates the variation of shape across a category. Uh, so in this case, we actually train uh, a neural representation that's learning two latent embeddings simultaneously. So one is going to uh, be to represent the shape and the other one to represent the texture. And these two things are actually disentangled in our neural representation. And again, we are rendering our, our current estimates and synthesizing, and we're minimizing a, a photometric loss. Now, what's exciting is that now at test time, so there's an optimization that needs to happen at test time, um, we're estimating shape codes and uh, the shape code and texture code that's needed for, for, this, for this image, that's going to explain this image. Um, and the nice thing is that once we've actually estimated these shape codes and texture codes, we can then use them to edit. So here is the fitting. Um, and now what I'm going to show you next is how we can then not just create novel views, but we can also edit the texture, uh, leaving the shape untouched. And we can also um, do the, the opposite. Um, and we can also do single view reconstruction and output 3D meshes directly from uh, the input images. And we can edit these as well. Okay, so this is, this is the end. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the end really. So, you know, this is, this is a, an exciting time to be working in, in 3D vision. Um, there's a lot of work now on you know, how to extend this to dynamic scenes. We've also seen uh, work presented before about relighting and, and, uh, um, and also you know, replay. Um, and also something very exciting is how do we learn these representations uh, in real time? Um, so I guess I'm, I'm over my time, so I'll, I'll finish here. Thank you.